Hi, Roshni. Shaheen, how are you? Very, very well. It's so lovely to have you join us and our students today. Thank um, you so much for having me. You're welcome, Roshni. As, as I, I said a few minutes ago, um, Inspire Ed is really a, a space for us to hear from such diverse perspectives, really honest thoughts about education. Um, and so as, as someone who's been such a role model in the field of education for all children, um, I'm gonna just jump in and ask you some difficult questions um, that may or may not have answers, but, but would love to hear uh, what's on your mind. And if there's anything else that you wanna share with our audience, please feel free to put that in as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, starting off, uh, Roshni, when you think of the, the term world-class education, what comes to mind? What is the picture that you're able to paint? Um, uh, I think the operative word, Shaheen, in world-class is world. So um, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, global exposure and uh, how can uh, one uh, soak in as much of it that the world is collapsing on us every moment that we speak and uh, you know boundaries are breaking people are that much more connected so uh, global exposure is one thought when it comes to world-class education the other um, is um, entrepreneurship uh, I think uh, um, there are certain values and principles of entrepreneurship which can be embedded much earlier in a student's learning journey. I think a lot of students tend to come across these thoughts perhaps in latter years of school or in college when they meet other kids or they think about, you know, what am I going to do, uh, you know, when am I going to get a job? Am I going to, you know, start a company of my own? Um, and um, while many succeed, many more fail. So mm -hmm. I think um, those, uh, you know, skills of uh, critical thinking, analytical thinking, flexibility, agility, some of that um, in the entrepreneurial mindset and uh, the, the ability to live with uncertainty, you mm -hmm. know, and if we can bring that earlier into world-class education schools, it's perhaps better. And the third one, um, which even today I think is not a focus in schools, is um, the focus on EQ, so emotional quotient. I think lots of focus even today tends to be IQ. And, and however, um, the world is getting more complex. You know, uh, the world that uh, students are going to is complex and it's only going to get more complex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, skills around um, communication, collaboration, uh, relationship building, um, mm -hmm. you know, actual, um, the social fabric of, of understanding your own social fabric and the social fabric of those around you um, is, um, is very critical. And the sooner we can do it with uh, students, the better it is. Yeah. Those, Those, yeah, yeah, no, such such powerful ideas. And when you think about EQ and you think about our global connectedness and entrepreneurship, which is um, so important and underlying that there are so many skills, you listed out some of them when you spoke about entrepreneurship. Um, tell me what you're seeing a teacher do when you walk into a classroom that is fostering the world-class education that you just described. What are you seeing the the teacher and students do? So I think um, the teacher has to be very dynamic and very contrarian. So uh, I actually see the teacher doing perhaps a lot more of what you and I grew up with when there was no tech. So which is actually going back to some of the basics, which is relying on books reading yeah. asking of questions uh, i mean assuming we went to the better educational uh, schools um, asking of questions um doing stuff by hand um not so much 
iPad and digital literacy. I think, I think what we miss, uh, you know, it was perhaps much more of a novelty, Shaheen, when you and I were growing up, to have tech in the classroom. Today it isn't. Yeah. The digital natives, they live with tech. So in fact, to break them out of tech, to break them and to bring them into a alternative universe where tech does not exist, but you can actually, I mean, how will you build EQ if you're going to focus so much on screen and not actually collaborate and team build with, you know, your peers in your classroom? Yeah. Um, um, reading, you know, um, when was the last time you picked up a book, you know, and um, so I think some of some of the old school teaching, it's a bit contrarian, uh, you know, I think a lot of parents would probably be aghast if there was a class without tech, but yeah. perhaps there's merit in that too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I I think that's that's really powerful, um, even for us as we go through Inspired, um, to really say, uh, are we being swept by by the notions uh, and the world around us, or are we really sort of stopping to say what really matters for children? Uh, what do we want to retain that has worked in the past, and what do we want to innovate and change moving forward? Um, so, so with that backdrop of the, the world-class education that we're all working towards, unfiltered Roshni, where is India today? If you were to describe the state of the system as broadly as you can, um, especially thinking about children coming out of almost two years of school closures with the pandemic, where are we today as a nation? Um, I worry, to be honest, uh, Shaheen, and... The only reason I do is because I think the past two years, perhaps urban schools have fared much better than their rural counterpart. Um, but by faring better, I mean um, digital has allowed for better connectivity. But however, I still go back to the original point that's helped in the strengthening of the IQ. Mm. You know, so that's helped kids, let's say, learn coding or, you know, basically um, drive up the skills value chain. But leaders, whether 100 years ago, or even as we see today or tomorrow, they are not leaders because they're similar in IQ to most, perhaps a lot more people in their class. What makes them different is their maturity and evolution of their EQ. So for yeah. me, I think I am worried because two years of COVID has given, um, um, tailwinds to perhaps uh, digital literacy or whatever or the digital revolution in education that uh, perhaps improves accessibility, but um, the real learning is not exactly what happens in sc screens. It's a bit like, you know, when we were in school, they used to say the real learning happens actually outside the classroom. Yeah. So today you would have to say the real learning is what happens outside the screen. So it's exactly the same concept. So I think that um, uh, today we need to get all our kids back into school. So I think two years of lull period, schools have opened, um, but you know, cases happen, cases don't happen, you know, but we have to find a way to have kids in school on a regular basis. And we have to, uh, I mean, you probably know a lot more about the curriculum than I do and the curriculum changes which are coming, but I don't know how much of it is focusing on, um, again, just um, developing the IQ or is there something which is also looking at the EQ? Yeah, it's such a, it's such a big question as we, as we move. And I, I think it's an irreversible trend uh, to embrace technology um, in education. Um, is there a way that technology can actually help build EQ or, or is it going to continue down the route which we've seen it predominantly uh, beyond so far, which is really to, to foster academic gains and, and IQ? I think it's a beautiful question. If I were to uh, push on, on the other side and ask you, did you see opportunities come out of the pandemic? And as an educator, were there some aha insightful moments for you um, in terms of how you thought about education uh, that you will take forward now that schools have reopened? 
Well, I think the aha moment for all of us would have been how beautifully the hybrid model worked, right? Yeah. So I think that the students, and not just students, actually, uh, I have to say, Shaheen, even the educators, how quickly um, they took to pivoting to the digital model and, and how quickly they took to delivering wherever they could quality um, education, you know, in the, in the hybrid model. So, um, and for some students, you know, um, who uh, tend to be um, a little more reserved, you know, maybe it helped, helped them come forward yeah. because they yeah. were behind, uh, you know, uh, the, the screen, you know, so to speak. And, and, um, and so there were some aha moments that could the hybrid model actually be a much more sustainable model going forward? But again, the operator word is hybrid, which means there is some physical uh, uh, aspect to education that has to still be remain. But I was amazed at how quickly students and educators pivoted and how quickly they um, this uh, new way of learning. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think this is a big question for us to hold as schools have reopened. Have we forgotten the benefits already of that hybrid? Because it is a it is a not easy thing to implement at scale. When you talk about blended learning, you're really saying, as you said, how can you learn beyond the classroom, but also how can you enable technology within a classroom, because there are certain things that are better done in person, and there are certain things potentially that are better done using technology. And that involves one in infrastructure for all children, where we know like 60, 70% of our kids today don't have that digital infrastructure, but it also involves retraining um, teachers to embrace a new, a new blended model. So again, I think a, a big, big thing for us to think about this week um, and beyond at Inspire Ed. Um, Roshni, learning outcomes, I think probably the most uh, often discussed topic uh, in education across India just are, are still abysmally low learning outcomes when you look at uh, most children in the country um, 70 percent of our kids are falling behind by grade three, 50 percent broadly, you know, are not able to read by grade five. When you when you think about a problem like that, what can we collectively do to shift not just foundational outcomes, but holistic outcomes for children like if we really have that bar going back to the first question of a world-class education and we believe that every child deserves that education what do we collectively as a as a nation need to do to come together and solve that you know Shaheen um my kids are quite young so my older one's nine and my younger one's six and and the one thing um I, I, I don't know if you feel this, but I actually feel that education, even at a very nascent stage, the learning outcomes and the education is actually quite complicated. It's not simple. Yeah. So, so are we, it's not that are we putting more pressure, but are we making the learning outcome itself a little too complicated? So if you were to just focus on, let's say, literacy and numeracy, are you connecting learning outcomes to grades and marks and performance or to life skills? Mm. And the truth is, as adults today, there's a lot that I was measured on learning outcomes through school and university. But today as an adult, I can say there were only about less than a handful that today helped me as a life skill. So, so is there a connection being made between learning outcomes of schools and what he or she or whoever will need as a life skill when they are an adult? Yeah. And is there a synergy between the two? Because at the moment there isn't. I, I think that actually, I actually think that's, uh, I, I don't know if you feel this, but I sometimes feel students have too much. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're, being, they're being measured on 
too many um, platforms, you yeah. know, and, and however, only less than a handful of those are actually relevant for life. So yeah. where is that? Where does that connect? Yeah, I think that's such a powerful and beautiful thought. I, I'm, I'm thinking of how different our actions would be if every day um, as teachers, we were, we were asking like, is what I'm teaching, like, does it matter for life? You know, and if it doesn't matter, let me get rid of it and focus on what actually does matter. And I wonder what we would end up teaching and how that would be different from what we currently teach. So I think that's, that's really powerful. Um, the other thought I often have is, you know, why are we not asking our children what they really need to learn? And, and so with that thought, um, my next question is, ha have you seen, I mean, you have young children yourself, I'm curious, even with your own kids, but certainly with the kids that, that you serve in the schools that you run, have you seen a role that students can play in driving their own learning and the learning of others. I think the traditional paradigm is that we're the experts, we're adults, we know what is right. Um, and we know why you need to learn, we know what you need to learn. And by the way, kids, we know how you need to learn as well. Um, we've sort of removed voice and agency from our children. Um, the question is like, is there another way? Like, is there a role for kids as partners in this work? Absolutely. So, you know, um, Shaheen, even for the Vidya Khan schools that I run, today, after having been in existence for 10, 11 years, you know, we've got, now we finally have a group of alumni who are out in the world, who've gone through their full education cycle. So they've gone through school as well as university or college. And now they are either at a job or they are, looking for a job and today when we run you know a survey from with them i think a lot of what i mentioned with you know the whole world class education some of this input actually came from them which was like in 678 did i really need to do cbsc mm -hmm. i understand that i have to do it in 10 11 12 because there's some you know measures of grades or whatever and i need to get into a college okay so that's fine but in my middle school or my really, uh, you know, um, primary years of learning, did I need to do this? So it yeah. made, so it, so it's coming from an alumni which has just recently been through the journey, actually questioning of that is it necessary? So again, Shaheen, it goes back to that question which I'm thinking to myself in a school where I can control the outcomes at least till they get to a national testing. Does it have to be? Um, related to curriculum or does it have to be related to the life skills you know today a lot of the, a lot of students um you know have living in living in a world where um they which is highly competitive to the point of combative a lot of it is actually lived not even in real time but it's lived on social media time you know um it's lived in a really in a uh, you know it's I mean, it's something even different than a meta or verse or whatever. Um, they, they're de dealing with issues that you and I can't fathom because we didn't grow up in that world. The context has changed. The context has changed, but the education has not changed. Yeah. You know, so the world, so, so to me, some of the questions and the, the education that students can give us is what is my context? Yeah, you are teaching me for example, but my context is, you know, I'm not able to survive in this particular situation, you know, and how do I navigate that situation. So I think that where students really can help us is help define the context and the world that they are growing up in. Yeah, but it's actually a world that we are growing old in. Yeah, they're old in. they're growing up in. It's a yeah, very big difference love that. too. So it's 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 a bit like looking at our grandparents, right? Our grandparents, I mean, not the real grandparents, but even our older parents, they lived in a generation where um, technology was coming to them, but they weren't owning it. They, it was just kind of part of their life. We were growing up where you know you had the Nokia cell phone, then you had the iPhone, and then you know whatever. So we really owned it. 
So yeah. they've kind of grown old in that world. Even today, you'll have your parents look at the phone and say, oh, how do I send this text message? Or do I get on social media? Whatever. They haven't owned it. We've lived it. Yeah. So I think it's a world we're growing old in. It's a world they're growing up in. Yeah. So they can give us context. We don't know it. We don't know it from their perspective. Yeah. Such a beautiful idea to remember the, the growing old and the growing up. Roshni, I think we just have one more minute, but I, I want to fit my last question uh, in for you. As, as someone talking to um, an audience, what's the most important thing for everyone to keep in mind um, as they think about something they can do for, for children's learning? What would you really want them to keep in mind? Uh, again, I think, Shine, this goes back to what I said before, because I'm experiencing it firsthand, is um, um, the whole aspect around personal development and emotional development. Uh, yes. So I think that we'll manage to make them bright, we'll manage to make them get good marks. You know, I think that's something that we've managed to do. But um, getting the... Uh, the, the social capital uh, uh, right for uh, students is absolutely critical, which, you know, which perhaps requires us as educators to get trained in or understand uh, human behavior much yeah. more and, and, and look at it, look at the student from that lens, you know, yeah. um, is going to be critical. It was critical before as well, but today, because uh, you know, there's this digital uh, wall which has come between people, you know, by way of cell phones or online or hybrid or whatever, it's becoming that much more harder, harder to permeate. So yeah. we have to be mindful of that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roshni, so much wisdom in your words and, oh, and thank good you luck so with all your beautiful work. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.